Uh, if you have your copy of God's Word, open up to Matthew 28. You might be saying, but that's at the end of the gospel. We've been talking about the beginning of the gospel. Yes, and today we're going to see how all of that relates together, how God is indeed truly with us. And so while we have already celebrated Christmas, we are not done talking about it yet. Lucy Van Pelt, in A Charlie Brown Christmas, declares that she never eats December snowflakes because it's too early. And if you recall, we actually had some snow last week, right? Just enough that if you wanted to go stick your tongue out, you could get some. She always waits till January, she says. Well, tomorrow... Tomorrow's January, and whether you experienced holiday woes like we've talked about from Charlie Brown or collected on your guiltlessly lengthy Christmas like Sally did, you can all have Linus's unwavering Christmas spirit for the rest of this year and for the next. During this month, we have seen that God is indeed with us us. And today I want you to know that this promise, this promise that is fulfilled in Jesus didn't just change the world some 2,000 years ago. It is still changing the world today. Now, you might not feel that way. I mean, there's a lot on the news. There's a lot that we see and that we witness and we wonder, where is God? What is going on? Why is our world in the condition and the state that it's in? But I want to let you know that, that God, well, he's not dead. That God is very active. That God is alive. And as we're going to see, he is alive in those who claim his name. And so if you are a Jesus person, if you are a Christian, then he is alive in you. And today we're going to see that we are to be a part of his kingdom, sharing the message of his kingdom in a world right now that, well, it's kind of dark. It's kind of bleak. It's kind of hopeless. But we can be hopeful because we can share the message of his hope with others to let them know that God with us is not just about a baby in a manger. It's not just about the decorations that you put up and take down every year, but it's about Christ in you, that you are the hope and the glory of God, that he has placed himself in you, and today we can go in his name and impact the world. It's happened. It's continued to happen. I mean, a small backwater nation known as Israel, within the course of a generation, took the name of Jesus to the entire world. With today's technology, with our connections, with our friends, our jobs, and people, can we too not take the name of Jesus to all that we hope and want to be able to hear it. And so he is still changing the world. And so are you ready to take advantage of the promise, his promise, that transcends, yes, the holiday season? Let us pray. There, Jesus, we do thank you for this day, for bringing us here today, God, for your truth, for your love. And God, I pray that we will have open minds and hearts to be able to hear and to respond. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So as we have read over the course of this month, an angel of the Lord said, Behold, the virgin shall be with child and shall bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which translated means God with us. Us. I mean, it's been the focus of our month. It should be the focus of our lives. This declaration is one of the most profound statements in all of human history because it, it's a promise. It's a promise that spans the ages. It's not just something that impacted some people at some time way back then. It's a promise that impacts everyone. In fact, it impacts those who are yet to have enjoyed life with us. And so the word translated 
is a practical euphemism for taking words from one language and rendering them useful in another language. That's what the word translated means. You take something from one language and you make it useful in another language. But quite literally, it means to make known or to explain with language, which just kind of as a parenthesis, is why words are so important. Words make a difference. In fact, we talked about that in our small group this morning, that we live in a culture right now that is trying to redefine what words mean. And it's important that we understand that words have meaning, that words have power and impact. And so we see then that this word translated means to make or explain with language. And so Matthew has let us know a truth then that changes everything. The declaration that God is with us means that there is an after effect to Jesus, an after effect with his encounter with the world. So the fact that he is with us, geeking out with language, means that he has a forever impact upon the world regardless of, if he is the baby, if he is the man, or if he is the one who has been risen from the dead. And so a forever impact. So Paul writes this in the book of Galatians. He says, when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son born of a woman, born under the law. See the Christmas story so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption as sons. And so we see that the Christmas story has a purpose, right? This purpose is to redeem us, to make us right, and so that we can have the adoption as sons. Now, as I've already said, words have meaning, right? Words are important. And so here he is saying that we are going to receive the adoption as sons. And half of you are sitting here thinking, if you're right, wait a minute, I am not a son, right? So if you are a lady, what does that mean? Because these words are important. And so what it means is that we are all receive adoption into a family as if we are the Son, as if we are apart through Jesus. We have special rights and privileges that according to that culture of that day was only given to the men. But it's not just men today that receive that. It's all of us who receive that privilege as sons, whether we are male or female. That's a huge, big deal. That means that God is not a God that excludes people, but looks for ways to include them as sons through Jesus here. He goes on and says, because you are sons, okay, all of us who know him, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. So God has sent his spirit, the spirit of Jesus, into us as his sons so that we have this intimate connection with God. Abba, Father, is a term of endearment. It's not something you would say just to anyone. And so in these words, in Galatians chapter 4, Paul is writing this, letting us know that everyone who follows Jesus has been declared right, has been adopted into the forever family of God to live as free people. Because verse 7 of this chapter says, Therefore you are no longer slaves, but a son, a position of authority and honor. And if a son, then an heir of God. So because God came to us, because God is with us, because if you know him, he is now a part of you, you 
have an incredible special place, privilege, and honor in the household of faith. You are not just an anyone, you are a someone in God's eyes. That's an amazing thing. You are not just the least in the family. God is saying you are of primal importance in the family. And some of you, you know, you know what that means. See, I didn't have siblings, so I was the favored kid, right? I mean, that's just the way it worked. Some of you as siblings, you know, if you don't, if you think you, you don't think you were the favored kid, you know, then maybe you are the favored kid, right? And so every brother, sister kind of faction thinks, you know, that one gets special privilege over the other. But what God is saying is that we all receive the special privilege because of Jesus, and that's how special that we are. So this everyone is the promise. Because God is with us, we receive this promise, and here's where we're going to connect it together with today's text found in Matthew 28. It's because of this promise that the now resurrected Jesus says this, all authority has been given to me in heaven and on earth. Go, therefore. So now because of this authority, he's transferring it. He's sharing this with us. Go and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. So, The gospel begins with God with us, and it ends with I am with you always. Amazing how God worked that out, right? The promise that God is going to be with us, and now it's the promise, the declaration, I am with you always. Well, who is I am? am. Well, here Jesus is saying, I am of the burning bush. I am with you always. I am the bread of life, the light of the world, the door of the sheep, the resurrection and the life, the good shepherd, the way, the truth, and the life. I am the true vine, and he is the one that is with us until everything is made right or whole or complete. See, that's what the word end of the age means. It means that there's a coming time where God is going to return and he's going to make all things right, and he's saying, I am with you until it is time to make all things right. So the spirit of his son, who is now in our hearts, according to the apostle Paul, who satisfies us, right, as the bread of life, who opens our eyes so that we can see as the light of the world, who gave us a choice for something better as the door of the sheep, who grants us new life as the resurrection and the life, who guides us in the best way possible as that good shepherd, who offers us truth that we can rely on as the way, the truth, and the life, that standard that never changes. You realize that the word of God abides forever. It is the same yesterday, today, and forever. I mean, we are told that by the prophets. And so God's truth is a truth that we can bank on no matter how we change words in our culture. It is something that we can cling to that provides us stability. And that way we know beyond the shadow of a doubt. And so it's that truth that we can rely on who provides us a forever friendship that impacts us in such a way that we are able to act now with his authority. 
that we are able to go to the nations and that we are able to teach what has been commanded so that all people can know the goodness of God. So because he is now in our hearts, because he is this I am who says that I will be with you always, who is demonstrated with the way that he lived his life, what he did, how he sacrificed himself, because of that, we now have his authority. Mm. We now can go and do things that we could not do by ourselves. And we have the ability to share things regardless of how learned we are, regardless of what we know or our abilities, so that people can hear the goodness of God. And we see that displayed in the early church, right? Because many of his disciples were not learned people, but yet they spoke with authority, and that they commanded a truth that was not of their own, but they were able to share it in a way that made sense because God used them and the stories of their life to be able to share it to people so that they could understand. And so if God could do that in the early days of the church, can he still do that now? Or is he too old and unable? Well, surely he's not too old or unable. And so we are called then to share the goodness of God. So we have been given the authority to act. It's been given to us. This authority is a conferred power. That means it's not of ourselves, but it's granted by God for a designed purpose of doing his things his way. So all authority has been given to him, and he gives that to us. And so we, think about the humbling and the awesomeness of all that wrapped up. He has given us his authority to act in his name. You know, we've heard people on earth say, well, do you know who my dad is? Right? You know, do you know who I am? Because those things have authority. Do you know what job or position I have? You know, and that gets you in places, right? We've heard it's not what you know, but who you know. Here, Jesus is saying we have the authority of Jesus Christ, those who know him. Whoa, that's weighty. Because I want to ask you today, what are you doing with the authority of God? Are you like some spoiled brat who is leeching off his dad, right? Getting away with things he shouldn't be doing and misrepresenting and, and, and trying to do things your own way and getting away with it because you said, well, hey, he's my dad. We know what we look, we look at people like that on earth and we think that's pretty sick, right? I mean, we see through that. And so I want you to know that if you're a Jesus person who is misusing the authority of God, the world sees that, and they think that is just as ugly. What are you doing with the authority that God has given you? We are authorized to make disciples. He is giving us this authority to do his things his way, not his things our way, right? Not our things his way, not our things our way, but he has given us the authority to do his things his way. And they're his ways and his things, so are they going to be good or bad? They are good because he is good. And so what is it then that we are to do to make disciples? This means we must seek people out like he did that he being Jesus. Jesus sought us out, right? He came to seek and save that which was lost. He came that while we were yet sinners and died for us. And so that means we must seek people out. Yes, it's great when they come in through the doors. It's great when they come and ask questions of us. But how often does that happen by itself? You realize most people come and are a part of a church because somebody besides me invites them. 
right? Someone besides the preacher. We must go seek people out. That's what the disciples did. They went to the people. This means we must show God's better ways like he did. So it's not just about going. We need to live a life that demonstrates that God's ways really are better. Do you really believe that God's ways are better than every other way? Because if you really believe it, then you need to stop with the stupid stuff of the world that you're doing. Right? If we believe his ways are better, let's don't do this anymore. And so if we want to reach folks, we got to seek, we got to show. But this means we also must solicit people to follow Jesus like he did. He said, hey, follow me. Sometimes we do everything, but we fail to close the deal. Well, what do you mean? Well, okay, no, I can't talk somebody into Jesus. That's not my role. That's not my job. But, you know, we sometimes just stop short of saying, hey, would you like to follow Jesus the way I am? Would you like to have him be a part of your life? I know that's the sticking point because we're afraid, well, what if they say no? Well, that's okay. I said no many times before I said yes. You probably did too. But we need to ask the question, right? Are you ready? Would you like? Now is a good time. How about today? You know, some people don't respond to Jesus because some people just have never asked them. You need to do that because we've been given his authority. What we're doing is good. What we're doing is right. When you love God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might and strength, then you will love your neighbor as yourself. When you really love God, that's when you will start loving people. So let that sink in. That means people don't love others because they don't love God. So we've been given authority to act. And we are to go to the nations. The nations are literally people who are joined by practicing similar customs, right? I mean, that's what nations really are. But they're also those of different races. So sometimes nations are grouped by different races. Sometimes nations are different geographies, right? It's because you live within these confines and boom, that makes you a people. And they've been a people for a long time. Sometimes the nations here are the unbelieving, but yet we are to go to the nations. I mean, we could even be silly here. You know, sometimes if it's just groups of people, that means we go to groups of people that are maybe different than us, right? Maybe you sport orange for your favorite team. Maybe you sport red for your favorite team, right? Maybe you were excited that in some weird freakish thing, the Dallas Cowboys won last night, right? I mean, whatever it is that it is, those are groups of people that we go to, right? That's just sports as an example. But you know, it could be groups that do other things, that live other places, that we are to go to them. But to go to these groups, there has to be some level of understanding, right? I mean, in order to to speak the language, to, to know what you're talking about, to see how things are going to work. So that means that we have to engage and learn about people who are different that we have to invest a little bit and find out why they are different and actually be interested in what they actually have to say to us, right? Because if we're not careful, we just want to be around people who are just like us. But what makes this room so cool is that it's filled with people who are not just like us. It's filled with people who come from different backgrounds and live in different places and do different jobs and have different views and all of that. And what's the one thing that ties all of us crazy people together? Jesus. Jesus is what ties us all together. All right? And so we are to go to the nations so that we can share with them what a real connection to God is all about. 
And so that means that we must ask questions and listen to their answers because that's what Jesus did. When Jesus talked to the woman at the well, he didn't just ask questions for the sake of asking. He didn't even just ask questions to make a point. He legitimately listened to what she had to say because that's the way you get to know people, right? Can you tell when people ask you something, but they're not interested in what you say? Yeah, we've been there. Have you been talking to someone because they ask you a question and you're answering it and they have literally toned out and you can tell they are not paying attention to you whatsoever that if you stopped mid-sentence, they wouldn't even notice? I mean, we've been there. We don't need to be that way to other people. This means we must apply the truth of God to the practicality of life just like he did. I mean, if we're wanting to reach people, we got to show them that God's word and his truth and his stuff works in everyday life because it does, does it not? And so we have to demonstrate that and show them how that happens. That's how we go to the nations. This means we must assist people and help them with life in a way that honors God like he did. So yes, we can go and be with people and kind of be like people, but that doesn't mean that we have to live and do the exact non-God-honoring things that they're doing, right? That we can be with them, but not completely of them, right? But yet we have to go, because how else will they know unless somebody tells them? Someone that they're willing to listen to because, perish the thought, we listen to them right? And so we've all learned something new so that we could relate to people. Maybe you picked up a new form of sports ball that you, you know, learned about because somebody was interested in it. Maybe you learned to talk trucks, or maybe you learned to talk farming, or maybe you've done all of those different things, right? Because you wanted to find a common interest that's going to the nations. That's what we are supposed to do. When you are willing to become all things to all people, then you by all means might see some saved, right? Because they will see that the truth of God is irresistible. And why would I not want that in my life? So you've been given this authority to act. You are to go to the nations. And lastly, we are to teach what has been commanded. Now, that's a pretty loaded statement, right? Because Jesus said to teach them all that I have commanded you. I teach all things. All right, now, this, he's talking to his disciples, right? Those that are gathered before he ascends. And as believers, we are called often what? Disciples. We, God is not just saying this to a select group of people. This is the great commission to all people. And so I think you you can tell if you were sweating, now you really are because you know where I'm going with this. You do not have to be a teacher to teach. God is saying we have all been commanded to share the good things of God. Each and every one of us, right? Right? You, me, regardless of age, some of our young ones can do a really good job of sharing the coolness of Jesus because somebody hasn't told them that they're supposed to be afraid of that yet, right? So, that which is taught must be every part that applies to complete the objective of faithful life. So all things that God commanded means that we need to, at the best of our ability, impart everything we can about what it means to be a Jesus person. And we can make different lists of what we would think the essentials are, right? I mean, and and there's a lot of cool essentials. Well, where do you start? Well, you start with one. But here are just some for I want us to think about. This means that, you know, we need to cause people to learn. See, that word teach there means to cause to learn. So it's not just sharing words and then not knowing what the result is. It means sharing words and things happen because of it. You know, you don't really learn something unless you're able to do it. 
And so this means that we must pursue the study of God's Word like he did. You realize Jesus studied God's Word? I mean, yes, I know. He was God. But, you know, he went to the, the synagogue, right? He broke open the scroll. He, he, he read it. When he was tempted in the wilderness, he quoted it, right? And so that means you and I must pursue the Word of God. Pursue it. It's important. Make it a part of you, right? I mean, think about all the things in life we pursue, and then I want to ask you how much of that is the truth of God. And if it's only this much of the truth of God, could that be the reason that maybe our lives aren't working out the way we want them to? Could that be the reason our society is the way that it is? It very well could be, right? So we are to pursue the study of God's Word. This means we must practice prayer like he did. You know, Jesus went off to pray. In the Gospel of Mark, which we will be getting back to, Mark's always talking about the fact that Jesus had just prayed or was going off to pray, but yet he's God, right? Yes, he is in human form, but yet so he thought connection with the Father was important enough. We should too. Do you realize the privilege it is to be able to talk to God? And not have to do all sorts of flaring, weird things. You and I can talk to him. He can speak and we can understand. Prayer is something cool, not something to be afraid about. I've told you, you don't have to be worried about praying the wrong thing. Because if you start out and it's selfish, that if you're seeking God, he will show you that. And your prayer over time will change. I mean, isn't that just like a friend influencing us when they hear us kind of constantly go off like this about whatever's going on, you know, and then they speak to us and we go, oh, maybe, maybe that's not so cool. Maybe I need to change. God does that for us. Prayer's cool. Last here, this means we must participate in worship like he did. You don't have to be here. You should want to be here, right? It's not about being seen, getting checked off, but you should want to be with God's people because God said the church is his bride, right? And who doesn't want to be with the bride? And so here we are. This is important. What we learn, what we connect, how we interact with each other, hugely important. And so this is something that we are to share with people. We are to share with people that God's truth is important, that you have the ability to connect with him through prayer, and that you should want to participate with each other, right? Because we want to participate in lots of other stuff. Man, this should be the primest. So when you let the word of Christ richly dwell in you, then you will be able to do all things, both in word and deed, as if to God and for God. Right? When we let him ritually dwell in us, it drives us and motivates us. So Jesus wants us to use all of his authority to go to all of the nations so that they may observe all all things, promising that he will be with us until he makes all things right in his return. It starts with God with us and ends with, I will be with you always. And so here's where I'm just going to tie it all up together so that we can see what we need to do. So if you're a Jesus person this morning, do you value God's word more than the approval of people? Do you desire time with God more than time on your device or the internet? Are there people you need to get to know better? Are you involved enough with other people to show them how God can make their life better. Who is the one, just, who is one person that you are seeking 
so that they could know Jesus. You know, there are just shy of probably about a hundred of us here today. Who's the one person? And if we're praying for that one person, right? And if we're actively looking for what God can do in that one person's life, let's just even assume that maybe some of you maybe have that same one person in mind. Could it be that there would be 50 more people here soon? 75 more people here soon? A hundred people? Who's just the one that you are seeking, using God's authority, go into? And then here's where it really gets to it. Who are you going to ask if they are ready to follow Jesus? That one, would you like to follow Jesus today? Now, maybe you're here today and you're not a Jesus person. Would you like to know Jesus as Lord and Savior? Would you like to have a friendship with God? Would you like to know how that you can regularly communicate with a God that wants to be with you and have a forever relationship with Him? You can. If you have that question, in just a moment, I'm going to pray. And if you would like to know Jesus, I want to ask you to step out and come forward and talk to me. I will do my best to answer that question for you. And if we can't take care of it right here, we'll talk until we can. But today is the day of salvation. Today, Jesus person, Christ is with us. I will be with you always. I want to ask you to bow your heads and to close your eyes. All of these promises are made by him. You don't have to worry about what you don't know. God takes care of that. You don't have to worry about the things that you've previously done because God says, if you ask me to forgive you, I choose not to remember that anymore. You don't have to worry about saying yes to following Jesus even. Because Jesus is calling you today, and you know it. And you should want to respond.